Good morning. Uh, I'm Gary Aylesworth. I'm representing the APL Executive Committee, and I'm pleased to welcome as our first plenary speaker of APL 2019, Professor Jeff Malpas. Dr. Malpas is currently Emeritus Distinguished Professor at the University of Tasmania since 2012, and Visiting Distinguished Professor at La Trobe University since 2007. He is known for his work across multiple traditions and disciplines, including phenomenology, hermeneutics, art, architecture, geography, new media, and the philosophy of language. His many publications include authored texts such as Place and Experience from 1999, Heidegger's Topology from 2007, and edited volumes including Gadamer's Century, Essays in Honor of Hans-Georg Gadamer from 2002, and Consequences of Hermeneutics, 50 Years After Truth and Method from 2010. Professor Malpas is especially known for his development of Heidegger's insight that place is not reducible to the modern concept of space. The latter indicates a limitless quantifiable extension where objects occupy positions laid out in a geometrical schema, but place, by contrast, is conditioned by its own inner limit or phenomenological horizon that allows things to be and to appear as the things they are to begin with. In their place, things are meaningfully related to one another so that the totality of their relationships constitutes a world. A world, of course, is also a dwelling place for human beings who are not mere observers of objects in space. Professor Malpas's many interests and areas of research bridging multiple disciplines and traditions make him an ideal speaker in this place, a place that has offered many different landscapes and crossed many geographical borders, a place with its own historicality and sense of belonging, of inclusion and free exchange. Welcome to the APL. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gary. That was a long, you said it was going to be a short introduction and that I shouldn't be bothered by its brevity, but it actually seemed to be, well, almost gave my paper for me. So <laughs> maybe I should just sit down. Um, thank you to the APL and Theory, Culture and Society, all the organizers of the Klagenfurt University for the invitation to come here. It's a great honor, especially as, as Gary pointed out, when we were talking beforehand, I guess I'm the first keynote speaker of the new, the new reborn APL since the, the period of interruption in its, in its occurrence. So it's certainly an honor to be here. So truth, fiction, illusion, three of these three concepts are the ones that seem to be at the center of this conference. Do these concepts simply stand alongside one another or is the relation between them more complex? In fact, I would argue both fiction and illusion depend upon truth. They are logically and perhaps genetically, parche Nietzsche, only possible on the basis of truth, that is, on the basis of a prior engagement with the world that is neither illusory nor fictional. And it seems to me that this remains so, even though there's a sense in which that engagement goes beyond the merely literal. Now, part of this idea, I think, Certainly in some of my previous work, it's an idea that can be found within semantic theory in terms of the notion developed particularly by Donald Davidson that basically truth-certing asotoric discourse is foundational to the possibility of meaning in any other domain. But it's also an idea that it seems to me that's captured in a different way in the comment of the French poet Paul Eluard that there are many worlds, but they're all in this one. And what I want to do today is to undertake something of an inquiry into the concept of world. So I'm not going to be boring you, perhaps, with semantic theory, but rather I want to talk about the concept of world. And it's that that interests me. And the path that I want to take into this discussion of world is a very particular one, because for the last, probably the last 10 years or so, I've been in involved in collaboration with uh, a poet, the Scottish poet Kenneth White, now, Kenneth, I'm hoping, will be known to some of you. Kenneth 
was, and let me just get my little piece of equipment. Kenneth was born in Glasgow in the Gorbals in 1966, growing up on, at Fairley on the Ayrshire coast, and he now lives in Brittany. Professor of 20th century poetics at the Sorbonne from 1983 to 1996, he's the recipient of many awards and honours, including the Grand Prix de Réaumont Français by the, the Académie Française, which he was awarded in 1985. Now, at the very core of Kenneth's work is this question of world. But the question, as it appears in Kenneth's work, work has, has, I think, while it's not gone entirely unrecognised, is often overlooked or taken for granted by many readers. And it's very seldom the focus for sustained discussion. Now, this is undoubtedly partly connected with the relative paucity of critical philosophical engagements with Kenneth's work, especially in English, and the associated tendency for his work to be approached from within frameworks that are primarily literary. I know of no serious attempt genuinely to think through the philosophical aspects of White's work in its own terms. But it also seems to me to be a function of the fact that contemporary thought continues to have difficulty in recognising the concept of world and the problem that it presents. Now, White locates his work, including both his poetry and his prose, and one of the things that's intriguing and interesting about White's work is the fact that he is not only a poet but also a, a prolific essayist. He locates that work in relation to a company that includes philosophers and explorers, no less than fellow poets and writers. And particularly notable in this regard are both Martin Heidegger and Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, geopoetics is the term that White has made his own. And the term could as easily be understood as world poetics were it not for the fact that the latter term might be thought too suggestive of something similar to world literature or world music. White himself tells us that geopoetics, quote, is concerned with worlding. And after noting parenthetically that wording is contained in worlding, he adds that, quote, in my semantics, world emerges from a contact between the human mind and the things, the lines, the rhythms of the earth. The active sense of world as worlding, as one might say the happening of world, itself echoes an idiosyncratic Heideggerian usage, die Welt weltet, the world worlds. The world emerges, however, only in and out of place. And consequently, the question of world cannot be approached, either in Heidegger or in Kenneth White, except through place. And so I read White's geopoetics as also a topopoetics. Indeed, the focus on world necessarily brings place to the fore, and it's place that seems to me the central notion in White's poetic thinking. Much of what I want to do here, then, is to explore White's thinking from the perspective of place, and thereby delineate the place of White's own thinking, to delineate and explore what White characterizes as, quote, the empty shore between Hegel and the Chinese gulls. It's a place that works between multiple traditions and modes of thought, and between poetry and philosophy. Now, Heidegger famously writes about the locatedness of his thinking in a particular place, a two-room wooden hut on the hillside in Topnauberg and the Black Forest. No less clearly, and in some ways even more directly, Nietzsche ties his thinking to place into very specific places, places, most obviously Sils Maria, high on the Engadine Plateau in the Swiss mountains, but also Turin, Genoa, Nice, and especially, in my view, Venice. Now, something similar can also be said of a host of other philosophers, poets, and artists from Cézanne, grounded in the countryside of Provence, named by Heidegger as his own second homeland, to Hölderlin in the Necker Valley, perhaps the preeminent German poet of place, as well as Albert Camus and René Char, and even Montaigne, another thinker who looms large in White's personal pantheon. The origins of White's work in the places in which he's lived, worked, and traveled, most notably the mountainous landscape of the Pyrenees and the Breton coast, is something to which he himself returns on many occasions in his own writing. The very room in which White works, a room that connects to a library below and might be thought to be an extension of it, is explicitly invoked in some of White's writing. But beyond that, the building of which it is part, the land on which it sits, the place itself, and the places around that place, Trebourdin, 
from the fields and towns to the coast and sea, appear throughout his work. Now, where else can thinking or writing begin other than in the places in which we already find ourselves? Not only do those places provide the physical support and sustenance that makes human thinking possible, but those places also provide the stimulus to thought, as well as the very stuff of thinking. In White's case, the room in which he writes is filled with a collection of books, maps, charts, and documents, as well as objects and curiosities from around the world. Kenneth is not exactly a hoarder, but certainly a bit of a collector, that makes up a magpie's nest of materials out of which thinking and writing can be made. In its setting within the Breton landscape, so too does that room, White's workplace and his home place with it, open up to an even wider body of materials for thought. And through that landscape, to a horizon that in turn opens out to the world. Thinking is thus grounded no less in what is without than in what is within. If White sometimes identifies himself with those Celtic monks sequestered away on the rocky gut coasts of Alba and Hibernia, it is not because he admires their studious isolation from the world, but because of the way they exemplify a mode of life that is turned to the world in and through the solitude of thought. Thinking, it is sometimes said, is without a place, a topos. But it's far better to say that thinking is always turned to the world out of its own place. It cannot forget that place. Or at least, if it does, then it risks losing its proper ground, losing its footing, slipping into an empty meaninglessness. The beginning of thinking in place is itself directly connected to what might be thought to be a certain solitariness that does indeed belong to thinking. And this is not a matter of some sort of selfish isolation, nor does it entail any failure of communality. Instead, it involves a recognition and awareness of one's thinking as essentially one's own. And so to a recognition and awareness of one's being as oneself. Such recognition and awareness requires attentiveness to one's own apartness and relatedness, both together. An apartness and relatedness that encompasses both others and the world. As René Char writes of poetry, quote, it is the loneliness without distance amid the busyness of all. Which means an attentiveness, a being in one's own singular placidness. It's in this way, it seems to me, that we should understand White's emphasis on the role of a certain Cartesian starting point to his thinking. Now, to refer to Descartes in a context in which I've already so strongly invoked Heidegger might seem odd, but Descartes is indeed significant here, not only because of the flame famously placed character of Descartes' thought in the meditations, but also because Descartes stands as the figure who marks out a path of thinking, perhaps only, only Augustine, provides an earlier precedent, that wherever else it may end up in the course of modernity begins with the questioning of the self, and so with the questioning of one's own place in the world. In beginning thus, Descartes' thinking brings us to that point which is perhaps the only genuine starting point from which thinking can emerge. If there's a potential for misunderstanding here, it is in supposing that in beginning with the self, we begin with something already known with the self as if it were indeed a subjectum, a hupercamenon, an already given and determined principle and ground. Yet if we read Descartes as White implicitly suggests, then the manner of Descartes' beginning is precisely with the self as opening up a space for questioning and inquiry rather than as already foreclosing upon that. And so White can write that it is, quote, only with the thinker in its isolation, the thinker in search of knowledge, that a new beginning can be made. And that's indeed the new beginning that Descartes himself attempts, as does Husserl also. And here a path opens that leads from ego-poetics, as we might call it, to geopoetics, from self to world, and also on to topopoetics. Places directly implicated here as Descartes himself invokes it, since the very character of the self as inseparable from the world as placed and as it stands in relation to place. In its being placed, the self is opened up to the world, 
And it's precisely the mode of being in place of the self, such that place becomes an issue for the self in virtue of its being in that place. Only thus can such an opening to the world occur. Moreover, place is itself that which relates. Place is essentially relational, but only as it also separates. It's that which separates, but only as it also relates. Such relating separating, which is actually the essence of the border or boundary, notwithstanding the many misunderstandings of that which abound today, such relating separating and the bounded openness that it presupposes is part, in fact, of the spatiality of place, and so part of the openness that extends back to the self and out to the world, in the same way as the dynamic character of that relating separating and its vibrating dimensionality, relating and separating being understood here not primarily as states but as modes of emergence, of unfolding, of coming to presence, these belong to place's essential temporality. Place encompasses both of these, not space alone, not time alone, but space and time, and indeed I would argue that it's only in place that space and time themselves emerge at all. Thinking can thus be said to arise as a response to the questionability, the dynamic openness and indeterminacy of our placed being in the world. And in being so placed, we're not in the world in some generalized fashion, as if we were everywhere and nowhere, as Thomas Nagel, in my view, mistakenly suggests, but always in some place. And it's in being there that we find ourselves already given over to a situation to which we must respond, a situation in which our own being is already at issue. This is why it seems to me the fundamental lesson of hermeneutic thinking in the 20th century has been that our being in place is not an impediment to knowledge, to understanding, but rather its necessary and essential ground. The solitariness of thinking which is the very solitariness of existence, is evident in the work of every thinker and writer, but evident in a superlative fashion in those who are most given over to such thinking and writing and to a reflective engagement in and with it. Thinking is inextricably tied to such solitariness, is a response to it and an articulation of it. It also requires it, as it requires a certain free and open space in which to find itself. In White's work, the solitariness at issue here is especially evident in the uncompromisingly personal tone of his writing. The thinking and writing that White undertakes is not some abstract, distanced form of analysis, but is always given in his own voice, through his own situatedness, from out of his own place. And that remains so in spite of the other thinkers and writers whose company White so often invokes. The explicitly personal or individual character of his writing undoubtedly goes against the grain of much contemporary writing and thinking. It clearly irritates those who see it as a source of pretension, even as egoistic or narcissistic. But this is to misunderstand the character of White's work. It's also to misunderstand White's personality, and perhaps also to understand the style of thinking that it exemplifies. White's work is founded in the same insistence on the personal voice that's also evident in Nietzsche. This emphasis on the personal may be said to follow directly from the poetic stance that White invokes, but it's not a function of that stance alone. It's directly tied to the character of thinking as indeed arising out of its own placidness, its own singular being in the world. And so in White's words, thought is always connected to sensed space, to a lived existence. What is at issue in White's thinking then is White's own existence, as this must always be what is at issue in any thinking. White's own life is what matters here, in part. And it's no surprise that life so powerfully and explicitly addressed in so much of White's work, as if that work were indeed a narration of White's own life, particularly evident, it seems to me, in the work that really established his fame, at least in France, his early essay on Guggenau, Letters from Guggenau. White himself has little to say about narration or narrative as such, and what he has said has tended to be highly critical of what he takes to be the fashion for stories and storytelling, and there's some truth to the critique that he wants to make there. White is suspicious, like Plato, of the story, mythos, 
as a promoter of falsehood and of the tendency for us to become enmeshed in the seductive power of story and of our own myth-making. But if we keep to the term narrative rather than mere story, then we might note the etymology of, etymology of narrative as coming from the same root as knowledge, the Proto-Indo-European no. And certainly White's own writing is full of narratives, as letter from Guggenau suggests, both his own narratives as well as the narratives of those who him, whom he invokes as travellers on the same path. Narratives that are grounded in the places about which White writes, tracing out the contours and directions of those places, following the passages that run in and through them, exploring their clearings and their shadows, and looking always to the larger open world to which they direct our attention. The very idea of narrative carries an important connection to place. Places are given shape and identity through the narratives that belong to them, although since narratives, or perhaps here we might indeed say stories, grow around places like weeds in an untended garden, so one must take care to attend to the differences between narratives and to the possibility that some have merely a superficial connection to the places and so also the lives with which they are associated. The narratives that matter cannot be mere inventions or fancies, even though they may draw upon the fictional and the imaginative, but must rather be integral to and constitutive of that to which they also belong. In much the same way as a certain geology, an ecology, or a topography are integral to and constitutive of a locality or a region. The narratives that belong to a place or a life are thus part of its very fabric and structure and coming to know and understand that place or that life is thus a matter of differentiating between the narratives that belong to it that are written into its tracks and contours from those that are mere impositions upon it. The narrative is indeed the vehicle of knowledge and a frame for experience, but it is not to be taken for granted all the same. Narration is the means by which place and self are shaped and understood. As such, it belongs to place, so the narration belongs to place, rather than, as I say, merely being imposed. It's because places themselves are constituted in and through narratives that they can be understood by means of narratives. And of course, here I'm taking narrative not to mean the conventional story. It's not the novel. It's not the literary work. It's something much more basic. It's the narrative that's involved in understanding how to get from A to B, how to behave in a lecture theatre like this, how to, how to find your way within a city or in your own home. It's also the case that narrative or narration never involves place or self as taken separately, but always and only as they're brought together, as they belong originally together. Self-narration is thus always a narration of place, as place narration is always a narration of self, both individually and collectively. This doesn't mean, however, that places are merely subjectively constituted any more than they can be said to be constituted objectively. Instead, places and selves appear together in intimate relation, each implicating the other, but neither reducible to the other. White's work exemplifies this sort of narrative interarticulation of place and self, both in terms of the entanglement of his own writing with the places to which that writing belongs, and in terms of the engagement with place that his writing explores. Such interarticulation has the consequence that neither place nor self can be understood as possessed of some self-same identity that is already established and independent of the other. And this means that the, the narration of self and of place must always remain incomplete, always indeterminate, always in question. Self and place are open and dynamic structures, each both shaping and shaped by the other, each given over to a constant interplay that always implicates other selves, other places, each taken up in that larger event that is the happening of world. This mutual shaping of self and place, as it occurs in narrative, reflects the role of narrative in the shaping of identity as such. Narrative is a fundamental mode of connection or relation, and especially of that form of connection or relation that enables both differentiation and unity. Of unity itself, White comments that, quote, 
It's not something given, not something to be taken for granted. It has to be composed. And this I take to indicate the character of unity is always something to be worked out, and not merely this, but also as something complex. Unity is never the unity of simple homogeneity or numerical singularity, even though the latter conception is all too often the one that tends to be assumed. Places exemplify the sort of complex and dynamic unity that's at issue here, a unity that I've elsewhere tried to elucidate using the example of old-fashioned topographical surveying, in which the unity of a certain domain or region is given through the interconnection between the locations that lie within it, interconnections established through the practices of triangulation and traverse. The identity of each location is thus dependent on its interconnection within the larger unity of the region, as the identity of the region is dependent on its articulation through the multiplicity of locations. In White's case, the identity and unity of the places that figure in his writings, from Guggenau to Glasgow, from the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic coast, have the same character as being worked out through the drawing of multiple connections. Connections that are made evident through the connections of those places to White himself, to the lives of those he encounters, and through the connections that are made within and between those places. To connect is also to move, to move between and among. If narrative is a connecting, then it's also a moving. And so the basic form of narrative is the narrative of movement especially the narrative of the passage through, across, between. It's thus that the earliest stories are so often stories of journeying, whether of gods, heroes, other travellers, the journey of the Magi. And the traveller's tale would itself seem to be the original precursor to the modern novel. Of his own work, or of a certain vision of that work, White writes that it is, quote, a practice, an activity, which consists in moving about in place and trying to say what one is aware of around oneself. Such movements evident in the style of White's writing, in its dynamic, active, mobile character, as well as in White's use of the journey itself as a key element in his work. The narrative element in that work can be discerned in this very emphasis on movement. But movement always presupposes free space, realm, such space being precisely space for movement, something that I think is real, rather nicely exemplified in the Bassano painting, this movement of the central figure, within a space, both the constrained space of the boat and the larger landscape in which the figure is set. And the space here always belongs, belongs to and arises out of the openness of place. As movement is also first and foremost change in or of place, a basic Aristotelian point, so place is invoked by the very idea of movement. The connection between place and narrative is thus mirrored by the connection between place and movement. The connection is a close one. Movement requires place as its essential precondition. Place, in its turn, is articulated and accessed at the most basic level through movement. But there's a common tendency to think of place and of places as essentially unmoving. Yet it's only through movement, or the capacity for movement, that place is known, and by means of which any engagement with place is possible. And it's also the means by which place itself appears as place. We find ourselves in place not by simply remaining in one location, in some fixed relationship to it, but by engaging with that place, by connecting the place to ourselves, which means in the first instance, to our bodies, and by connecting that place to other places. Such engagement and connection are fundamentally based in movement and the capacity for that movement. And of course, movement itself requires orientation. But this doesn't detract from the role of movement and the capacity for movement in making orientation possible at the same time as it draws on it. Thinking itself as tied to place is tied to forms of movement, to orientation. Na narration is a form of movement, but so do does the solitariness of thinking have to be understood as inseparably bound up with a mode of spatiality 
evident in an essential apartness, which is of necessity also a spatial apartness. And this is reflected not only in forms of thinking, but in the comportment of the body, particularly when it is given over to such thinking. The role of spatiality in thinking is evident in the way in which thinking is tied to the experience of a certain sort of openness, an openness that appears in terms of the experience of both interiority as well as of exteriority. The way thinking opens up an inner space of the self that contrasts with the outer space of the wider world is itself an essential element in the possibility of thought. And although this contrast has often been misconstrued in ways that have given rise to many problematic tendencies within the history of philosophy, it cannot be abandoned or ignored. Only because thinking does indeed open up in this way, only because it does entail a certain sense of apartness and separation, can it engage reflectively with itself in connection with others, in connection to its objects. Thinking becomes both an enactment and an exploration of the very space and place in which it arises and to which it gives rise. That connection between thinking and spatiality and to movement takes on a particular character in Nietzsche, not only through his explicit thematization of certain places and landscapes, but in his connecting of thinking and writing to bodily movement, especially to walking, and in a seemingly unsettled lifestyle following his departure from his university post in Basel. The epigram epigrammatic style of Nietzsche's thought also epitomizes its active and dynamic character. White's biography may exhibit a more settled mode of life than, than Nietzsche's, and his work is expressed in the poem and essay rather than the epigram, and yet it is, as should already be clear, no less active or dynamic. Live thought, White writes, is erratic and erotic in its nature, full of tentative explanations and existential energy, and the essay form proceeds by a series of intellectual sensations and logical leaps. This emphasis on activity and movement, and so on spatiality too, as vital characteristics of thought, feeds directly into White's characterization of his thinking as nomadic. The nomadic is a key concept in White's thinking, drawing together several important elements the use of multiple authors and sources, the engagement across traditions and cultures, the active and mobile character of thought, the very openness of world. It's also, of course, a concept that immediately implicates notions of place and the topological, since the nomad is precisely one who is defined by their relation to place and by the character of that relation. The best example of this perhaps being Australian Aboriginal culture, but it's true of nomadic cultures everywhere. The nomadism to be found in white can indeed be compared to a similar nomadic quality in Nietzsche, but it's nevertheless quite distinct from the idea of nomad thinking that also appears in Deleuze and Guattari, Deleuze being one of white's examiners when he completed his state doctorate. For white, the nomadic involves a sense both of the bounded and the open, it's a genuine engagement in, in the world as that occurs in and through place rather than merely through the movement of unbounded connectivity and flow. The latter, it seems to me, being much closer to what we find in Deleuze and Guattari and also, I would add, being essentially indistinguishable from the space of modern techno-capitalism. And I would argue, in fact, that one of the problems of much contemporary supposed supposedly critical engagement with space and place, is that it actually re it duplicates the conception of spatiality that we find in modern capitalist formations, rather than directly taking issue with it. Now, although acknowledging the nomadic, nomadic elements in White's thinking, Deleuze in comp company with Guattari is nevertheless critical of the centrality of the explicit Celticism in White's work. White's references to the Celtic as well as to the Northern and the Atlantic, Finisterre is a particularly important location for White, bears comparison with Nietzsche's opposition of the Southern with the Northern, where the Northern in Nietzsche's case means primarily the Prussian. Here thinking is tied to a place or a region, and in Nietzsche's case, in a way that's also explicitly polemical, polemical and oppositional, part of an attempt to disrupt the usual ordering of things and to reorient thinking towards a different landscape to shift the focus of attention from the center and towards the periphery. 
The emphasis on the periphery, the margin, the edge, the border, is characteristic of precisely that mode of thinking that turns explicitly towards place. It's one of the reasons why Ed Casey has been so preoccupied with the edge in his latest thinking. Such thinking is a thinking of and typically at the edge, since it is there and not at the center that place most readily appears. Indeed, the Greek topos, at least as it appears in Aristotle, is itself tied to notions of surface and limit. And this focus on the edge can be understood as already present in the very idea of place as such. White locates himself at the borders, not only through his location in Brittany or in his focus on Scotland, but also through his intellectual location at the margins of contemporary intellectual culture, fitting into no dominant paradigm and, like Nietzsche, aiming to unsettle existing trends and traditions. The placed character of White's thought and its thematization of that placidness is itself tied to a feature that I would argue belongs essentially to the poetic. Its groundedness in the unique and the singular, in the situated and the concrete. Even the most abstract of poetry has its origins in sensory experience, even if it be the sensory experience of spoken or written language itself. And almost all poetry begins in close attentiveness to the ordinary details of the world. It is in those details, and not apart from them, that any real transcendence, understood more as an opening than a going beyond, is to be found. At the end of Letters from Guggenau, White writes, And I bless the name of poetry, and up there in that wood knew the glory of the poet, the real poet who writes and speaks from the heart of nature, his greater home, and sends its living streams through the world. The experience that lies behind these worlds is an experience of nature, not merely as that which is distinct from the human, but rather as the sheer and constant presencing of being as that occurs in place. That experience is one that comes to light not in any abstracted realm of the mind, if there could truly be such, nor in some anonymous and emptied location apart from the world, but, quote, high up there on the slope of the valley, among the chestnuts and the winds, near thick clumps of pink serpile. We find the world by entering into it, and it is place that is the entry into world, where one might say the world has its beginning, and where perhaps the poetic has its origin also. So the poetic is itself always speaking and working out of place. The poetics of place and of the world that's at issue here concerns the intimacy of the relation between language and place, of word with world, and so relates directly to an understanding of language that sees it as inseparably tied to the opening of world. This too is something powerfully present in Heidegger's thought as well as White's. For this reason, one might argue that Heidegger's own apparent linguistic chauvinism, the prioritization of German and Greek, is less to do with any form of nationalistic blindness, even if there are elements of that there, than it is a reflection of Heidegger's own inability to think other than in those languages in which he is already at home. One might say that the only language in which one can think or in which we can poetize, which is perhaps not far from being the same thing, is indeed our own. If Heidegger didn't put it in just these terms himself, it's perhaps a result of the fact that he was unable to distinguish his own thought from thinking as such, a philosophical egoism to which he was undoubtedly prone, rather than just a matter of any simple nationalistic sentiment. Yet every thinker, is surely tied to their home language, as is every poet to their native tongue. White may be thought to present an intriguing case in this regard, working as he does against both French, across both French and English, although his poetry, the real essence of his thinking, is exclusively in English, even if perhaps Scots English, and not in French. It's through the word of poetry through genuinely poetic speaking, whether it occurs in the essay or in the poem, and which is always a placed speaking, that the relation between world and word comes most clearly into view. 
The poet, then, is the one who lets the world speak, and so also the one who allows the language of the world to emerge, that allows a genuine poesis, a poesis that can occur notwithstanding the placed character of the poet's writing, but precisely in virtue of that placedness. Such poesis is the primordial poetry of the world, and as such it is also that which speaks the world, that which speaks the human. Language speaks, declares Heidegger, and he adds, if we let ourselves fall into the abyss denoted by this sentence, we do not go tumbling into emptiness. We fall upward to a height. Its loftiness opens up a depth. And so for Heidegger, language is nothing subjective. And this is, I think, a key point that also comes across not only in Heidegger, but in the work of a number of other philosophers of the 20th century as well. What is at issue here is an essential dimensionality that belongs to language, a dimensionality that allows relatedness and separation, hiddenness and disclosedness, difference and sameness, proximity and distance. In White's work, this dimensionality is precisely what appears in the idea of the open world, the title of his collected poems, the open world that is disclosed poetically, and so such dimensionality can be seen to lie at the very heart of the notion of geopoetics, which I would indeed insist must take the form of a topopoetics. The poetry of the world is the poetry of place since it is with place and only with place that the world begins. And the opening of place, which is the happening of being as well as the speaking of language, is itself the taking place, the worlding of world. In talking of that empty shore where Hegel meets the Chinese gulls, White not only indicates his attempt to move beyond the dichotomies of previous Western or European modes of thinking, but he also draws attention to the concrete situation of poetizing and thinking as always out at the edge, at the point of intersecting lines of flight, looking towards the far horizons of land and sea. This is something that's echoed, I think, particularly well in Nietzsche. It's why Venice, as well as Genoa, are so important in Nietzsche's thinking. The character of White's empty shore as a place where different paths and lines of thinking may meet and from which new possibilities for thinking may emerge reflects not only its character as a meeting point, but also as a between place, a space of liminality, a place in which both speaking and thinking can be said to have their origin. To some extent, we all begin on that empty shore, a shore on which there is no subject nor object, no mind nor thing, but only the stillness into which language beckons us, a stillness that belongs to the openness of world and that gives space to all things in the speaking that belongs to them. White's reference to this place, this shore, invokes a certain place for thinking as well as for experience, a place too for fiction and maybe even illusion. But although, and as such, it articulates a singular ontological poetics, a poetics of world and worlding, but although the thinking at issue here is fundamental, both in character and orientation, it's not a thinking that occurs merely at the level of an abstracted or internalised reflection removed and apart from things. White, says, White writes, we're talking about a poetics that does not aim at closed artefacts, nor is content to simply comment on the sociological context, but is based ultimately on the idea of an energy moving across space. It is, in other words, a poetics that is active and engaged, the language of an open self in an open context, as White writes, just as the conception of world that it elaborates is itself dynamic and expansive. White argues for a new form of culturally grounded politics that in being attentive to its place is also attentive to the openness of world. Such openness, I would argue, is at the very heart of the democratic. Indeed, it's surely what separates democracy from the majoritarian, majoritarian, the demagogic, the populist. If geopoetics is about the openness of world, then our contemporary situation, as White reads, it takes the form of a closing off of the world. And this is just what is at issue in White's idea of a mediocracy, 
a generalised levelling down and emptying out, a turning away from any real sense of participation in life or in the world, a mode of being, quote, almost totally inverted, marked by an almost complete lack of sentient, intelligent, creative contact with the environment, that contact without which the world can come into existence or be maintained. White's claim is that it's only through our re-engagement with the openness of the world that we can re-engage with ourselves and that this is possible only in and through the concrete singularity of place. And so, so through both residence and journey, stillness and movement, nearness and distance. In the early 21st century, the need for such re-engagement is, it seems to me, more urgent than ever. The question of world is thus not a question that arises out of mere intellectual provocation or curiosity. It's not a question that we may choose to take up or put down. It is the fundamental question of our, or indeed of any age, though in our age it seems to be more pressing than it has ever been. In asking after world, we also, also ask after ourselves. Who are we? What are we? But also, where are we? Um, God's first question to Adam. The first, the first speaking of God in the, in the Hebrew Bible is to Adam, where are you? On that empty shore that White invokes, amidst the cries of the gulls, we find ourselves at the edge of the world and yet also at its very centre. Here at the very threshold of existence, where thinking and poetry come together, the world itself beckons, and we are left either to respond or else to relapse into forgetfulness and oblivion. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for questions and comments. Uh, I believe there's a microphone, so if you would wait to get the microphone to ask your question, that would be uh, most helpful. Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Malpas. Uh, very short question. I noticed the title from White, Ideas of Order at uh, Cape Wrath. This yep. evokes the poetics of Wallace Stevens a lot. The famous poem by Wallace Stevens, uh, The Ideas of Order at Q West. Wallace Stevens has a poem called uh, Description Without a Place which stands for a lot of his poetics, uh, in which the pre predominance is given to the sort of mental figurative space over, over the physical space of any given place. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how Kenneth White would uh, relate to, to this sort of poetics. Uh, it seems to me that Stevens wanted always to be uh, placed, in a, I mean, relate to a place, but in such a way that in which this place sort of dissolves and um, I wonder if White has anything to say about Stevens as his predecessor or maybe antagonist here. Well, I think White actually think, thinks Stevens as, again, a poet of place. And I think White and I would probably read Stevens in exactly the same way. And that is that Stevens is not, as it were, um, privileging the empty space, the anonymous space over place, but rather is exploring the way in which place itself is a space of indeterminacy, a space that is full of questioning. Okay, so now I think that's a really important point. I think it's there in White's work, but I also think it's there probably in Stephen's work and in the work of many other thinkers. So the fact that a, a poet or a thinker might characterize, might emphasize almost what you're referring to as the dissolution of the place doesn't seem to me to undermine the claim that I'm making here, or that I think White would make, about the primacy of this engagement with place first. But the point is that place is not, doesn't, place is not already determined. Uh, even though very often what we are, that's what we assume, I think one of the common understandings of place, particularly in much of the social scientific literature, is to assume that place is an exclu exclusive and regressive concept because places already have identities. I've yet to encounter a place whose identity I know. Um, so it seems to me that this dissolution of place is actually really important in the thinking of place. 
It's there in White's work, but it's there in a different way. It's part of the, the genuine interrogation, if you like, in Heideggerian terms, of the, of the character of being, which isn't, which isn't an interrogation of that which is generalised or anonymous, but it is an interrogation that comes back to us. So I, I would contest the idea that, that White and Stevens are simply to be set in, on opposite poles here. I think they're both engaged with the same issue. But this issue about dissolution, about ambiguity, in, or better, indeterminacy, I think is actually at the very heart of the thinking of place. And in all of my work, it's probably one of the most important things, because as I say, the tendency is to assume that place is already determinate, that we already know what it is, right? And I actually think that's indicative of a deeply uncritical attitude in much of the thinking that goes on. Place is actually the, the, the pla the, that in which questioning uncertainty and indeterminacy first arise, and to which we've always got to go back. Okay, there's a question here, and then here, and then. Hi, Jeff. Um, just more clarification rather than a question. Uh, there were several scattered comments without, uh, within your presentation uh, about the sort of political implications of place. You talk, uh, talked about uh, a sort of capitalist conception of space that is opposed to the sort of conception of space that you're uh, describing or the sort of uh, demagogues in a kind of democratic setting uh, that again uh, do not accord with that openness of place, openness of the world that takes yeah. place through, through, through place. So, um, and, and a few other comments. So, like, I would like to invite you to elaborate a little bit more on that democratic and political aspect. Given how difficult it is, as you're dis defining, uh, describing a moment ago, and, and that's a major theme in your work anyway, uh, how difficult it is, how impossible it is to define place. I mean, uh, how do we open up a place other than for a singular individual? How do we create a political community when place cannot be defined. We, we know Heidegger's kind of root when he's talking about the Greek temple that gathers the people together to give them a destiny, and that's a kind of dangerous kind of root that we want to avoid. But what other ways do we have to create a political community given the determinacy of place? Yeah, I mean, I don't read the origin of the work of art and the role of the temple there in quite the way that you were suggesting there. I, I read it in the way that's suggested politically by the sorts of comments that Heidegger makes in the Parmenides lectures in the early 40s, where he talks about the connection between polis and polos. And there his emphasis is on the way in which the polis has to be structured around something that is, as it were, at its centre. And I take that to be very similar to the sort of idea that one finds in Arendt about the place of the public domain within which p politics has to be articulated. Okay? Now that articulation, it seems to me, has to be with respect to common objects and practices. And one way of reading the origin of the work of art is to think of the temple not as simply giving you a determinant of identity that's set down thus and thus and thus, but rather as providing a common object and a common set of practices around which common articulation is possible. So I think there's another way of reading the origin of the work of art, regardless of whether that was Heidegger's intention or not. We could argue about that. So when we talk about the political implications of, or the political implications of the sort of topographical or topological approach that I'm adopting here, one of the things that I think is important to do is to set that against the sort of analysis that I've given elsewhere of the character of, of what I think of as contemporary techno-capitalism, um, the character of technological modernity. Now, my analysis of that is partly indebted to Heidegger, but not only. And my analysis there is one that argues that, in fact, what's characteristic of the contemporary world is indeed the sort of emphasis on relationality, network, flow that one finds in Castell's work, um, that a number of other contemporary geographical and social scientific thinkers have talked about. I don't see, however, that, as it were, Embracing that is the solution to our political problems or indeed to the problems of modernity because it seems to me that what we currently have, the situation in which we see populist right-wing politics dominating, the situation in which it seems that it is now in increasingly difficult to articulate notions of a genuine public realm, a genuine sense of the common good, that this is directly related 
to the way in which the world has been transformed by precisely a certain form of spatialized capitalism. And the spatialization is important because that spatialization is directly linked to forms of genericization, um, to dissolution of difference. So I don't think of the current world as one that celebrates differentiation. I see it as one that celebrates, in fact, the homogenous, because the homogenous is fundamentally that by, through which modern technology operates. So a crucial step for me is to look at the character of the world and to see the way in which modern techno-capitalism in fact drives out any different mode of understanding through its imposition of a certain form of spatiality. In response to that, it seems to me, the, the real possibility of critique, the real possibility of resistance, doesn't depend on giving oneself over to sheer relationality and a refusal of boundaries and all the rest of it. Instead, it means coming back to actually where we first find politics arising, which is in the, the engagement with others, the engagement with ourselves, the engagement with a world, which doesn't occur in any abstracted space it doesn't occur in the space of number. It doesn't occur in the space of economic exchange, mere economic exchange. It occurs in the space of real engagement with one another. Okay, so when I talk about coming back to place or reasserting the primacy of place here, what I'm wanting to do is to reassert a sort of, you might say it's almost a sort of Levinasian <laughs> politics because it's a politics that tries to reassert the importance of this concrete engagement, this open space. It's no accident that when we talk about the public, very often we think of the piazza or the place, that open realm in which we meet with others. So it's about reasserting that. Now, I'm not going to give you any recipe for how to do that because I think one of the lessons that we learn from Heidegger and from Plato and from a few others as well is that as soon as, poli as, soon as philosophers try to tell you how to do politics, you need to beware. Right? And the philosopher should beware more than anything else. The philosopher is not there to tell us what to do. The philosopher is there, the thinker is there in part to warn us. So I guess my model of the philosopher is more the Old Testament prophet <laughs> than it is the, the New Age utopian thinker. Um, so when I say come this, when I'm reasserting the character of place, and I'm also claiming that this is the essence of the democratic. I guess, I mean, one way of putting this is to, to it's a notion of the democratic I think one can find in a number of places. I think it's there in Arendt, in that idea on the importance of the public domain and the renunciation of violence. I also think it's there in Camus in a slightly different way. He describes the, the democratic as residing in the willingness to allow one's enemy to speak, and not only to speak, but to allow that he or she might be right. Now that, that means opening up a space for speaking, opening up a space for disagreement but also f and contestation, but also of acknowledgement. Right? And again, this does not happen in some generic anonymous anywhere. It happens here. It is always specific people with whom we are engaged. It is always specific communities that we have to work with. It, al it is always in and through specific spatial configurations. And I'm not just making the sort of rather truistic point that, you know, you have to act locally, you have to act locally and think globally. That's not my point. Um, my point is a much more basic one about how we engage in the world, and that engagement begins here, not out there first. So, so I'm probably not going to give you what you want, or maybe what you were asking for, which is a more concrete political program, um, but I have reasons for not wanting to do that. But it does seem to me that the only possibility we have if we are to respond to our contemporary situation is to refuse some of what modern techno-capitalism tries to give us in terms of its spatializing rhetoric and come back to a much... A much more specific, more concrete, more placed mode of engagement and of thinking. Uh, the next question was down here. Oh. The mic is coming. Uh, thank you very much for your paper. I was wondering if you could comment on the notion that in order to maintain the indeterminacy of place that you spoke about, we have to introduce a certain notion of displacement into the equation. 
perhaps I could proffer the image as well of the stateless person being displaced? Um, I'm not about maintaining indeterminacy in relation to place. Places are indeterminate, full stop. We can either recognise that or we, we can forget it. Um, displacement for me is always a mode of placement. It's placement that comes first. I think one of the mistakes we make, particularly in some of the discussions around debordering, migration, refugees and so on, is to forget that the displacement that we see there is not an absolute state. It is a form of displacement, that is a disturbance of being placed. Um, somebody who I think makes this point rather well is Jean Amery in his essay, How Much Home Does a Person Need? which is really his response to his experiences during the Holocaust. And in that essay, he talks about the experience of the Holocaust, not just in terms of, of death and extermination, but also in terms of the loss of, of place, the loss, you might say, of home. Now, home has become a difficult term for people to talk about. But the experience of the refugee is not an experience that says, hey, I'm, I'm displaced, and that's really good. <laughs> The refugee is the one who has been refused home, who's been cast out of home. And so the task for countries like Australia, tasks that they have not responded to very well, is how one is hospitable to the refugee, and that means how one offers some semblance of, of new home to the refugee, to the displaced person. So one of the things I think we need to think about much more carefully is the relationship between, or the character of displacement as a modification of place. And that also, also ought to indicate to you that when I talk about place, I am not meaning some notion of a secure, safe dwelling place that we are always in and everything's hunky-dory and nice. Okay? This is part of why I emphasise place's own indeterminacy. Every place harbours within it the possibility of displacement, of disturbance. Okay, and I actually think that this is an important element in Heidegger's work. But unless we think the relation of displacement to placement, unless we understand the character of the loss of home that is part of the experience of migration, the experience of forced displacement and of the refugee, then we won't properly respond to or be able properly to think that. And in fact, we will contribute to the displacing that's already occurring. We will contribute to the, the dispersal of people from places in which they can find some sort of a life. Um, so place for me is an incredibly complex concept. Um, the refugee camp's a place. It's a problematic place in many respects. But one of the peculiar things about the refugee camp too is that it's a place that many people will try to make into a home, into a place in which they can live. Because that's the only way in which they, we can be in the world. So this is the great, if you like, injustice of the contemporary world, if you like, particularly, because the world that we have now is a displacing world, and that means it's destructive of genuinely human modes of being. That is, modes of being that recognise and are attentive to that place in which we find ourselves, and therefore are attempt attentive to self, to others, and to the wider world. Um, and I'm not saying that you can get some sort of utopia in which everybody lives happily ever after, because that's not part of my story either, right? Place is always demanding, it's always asking for a response, it's always asking for responsibility. Um, but I don't think we can respond to the current crisis if we, and I do think it's a crisis, unless we rethink these fundamental notions of place, of home, and of self. Home and self are actually correlative notions. So. Next question is there in the center. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. And I, I liked um, that you point out to the connection between um, places and space and, and thinking. And I liked your examples. Um, and I'm wondering um, what, what happens if we take other examples? Then I, I think maybe um, there is a problem, namely when um, there are anthropological statements made. And I can think of, for instance, uh, Schopenhauer, who says that, uh, well, thinking, the, the, the will is weaker when there is warm climate. Hence, uh, people in India can make better philosophy, and those who live in cold countries, it's futile to think because we cannot make philosophy over there. 
Um, this is one case, and the other case is uh, Kant, of course, which is plain yeah. racist uh, anthropology or kind of silly um, pre critic uh, writings with thinking about what happens to aliens that live on other planets with another gravity, then there is a kind of other reason that we are not able to, to reach at all. And I, I think it's quite similar because there is a very close connection between thinking and place, and I'm wondering what you think about that. Um, well, there's a, there are a number of thinkers who make these sorts of claims, Kant and Schopenhauer, are two of them, but they're certainly not alone. Uh, there's a long tradition, for instance, of arguing that, that cl very often it's climate that's taken as being determinative. And of course there's a tradition of geographical determinism as well, uh, often taken to be inaugurated by Friedrich Ratzel, um, and continued to some extent by um, Paul Vidal de la Blanche, although Vidal de la Blanche is, is a slightly more modified position. Um, I would distinguish, I actually think Ratzel is a hugely underestimated thinker because I think there's much in Ratzel that we should be going back to and rethinking, just as I think there's a great deal in Vidal de la Blanche's work that I think is worth looking at more closely. Kant, in particular, is a more, well, you could say a problematic case, is also a particularly interesting case because, on the one hand, in the Critique of Pure Reason, there is... Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason is, is one of the first philosophers to genuinely try to think through the fundamental structures of spatiality and of place in relation to human being. And this is something I've written about with Gunther Zöller, for instance, uh, as to how this is to be worked out within the structure of the first critique. But at the same time, in the anthropology, you have, and elsewhere, you have these comments where he seems to be adopting a much more simplistic form of climatic or geographical determinism. And these claims don't seem to be well grounded in the rest of Kant's thinking, and they certainly don't connect up very well with the sort of comments that he, the sort of account that you get in the Critique of Pure Reason. So one point that you, one thing that you might do is to distinguish between these often somewhat naive and simplistic anthropological observations that one finds in philosophers like Kant from the more nuanced ontological account of place that is being offered somewhere like the Critique of Pure Reason. Now that's actually quite important because most of the work that I'm interested in doing is at that second ontological level. I'm not, I'm not in particularly engaged nor terribly interested in the sort of naive anthropolo anthropology that you find, the simplistic anthropology that you can find in some of those other places. That doesn't mean there isn't something to say, for instance, about the relation between human comportment and climate, for instance, because clearly there is. But it can't be at this general level that says if you live in a hot climate, you're incapable of doing philosophy, right? Um, but there might be other connections, and we know that there are other connections. There are certainly connections that are physiological and biological in terms of the way in which climatic conditions affect human being. But they're at a much more nuanced and detailed level than these sorts of gross overgeneralizations. So, so I wouldn't see the examples you're giving there as running in any way counter to my position. What they do indicate is that when we think about these issues, we have to think carefully, right? That seems to me a pretty basic sort of requirement. You can, uh, but it also perhaps shows something about how fundamental the thinking about place can be and how easily people can slip into stereotypical and other problematic ways of thinking about place. Now, I think that's because place is so important, right? so fundamental. Um, I think we often think most simplistically about the things that are most basic, about the things that matter most to us. We're most ready to sort of grab at particular ideas. And we're very ready also to use differences in place as a way of, of understanding or as explicating other sorts of differences. So we have to be careful about all those sorts of things. But that doesn't count against the sort of ontological account that I think we can give here, the sort of ontological account that says, look, it doesn't matter how this works out. It doesn't matter that we might misunderstand this. It doesn't mean that we might misuse this. This is still a fundamental structure. So I think one of the, one of the problems in some contemporary discussions about place is that there's a tendency to move too quickly to take up certain sorts of political misappropriations of place and therefore say, oh, we should get rid of talk about place completely. Right? That's a bit like saying, oh, look, there are some people who really get justice wrong. 
or really misuse the notion of the good. So we should stop talking about the good or the just. That's the wrong move. The right move is to go back and say, look, these are fundamental concepts. These are not concepts we can abandon. If we abandon them, then we commit ourselves to misunderstanding ourselves. We commit ourselves to an inability to deal with those misunderstandings. The real move is to go back, to reclaim, to rethink, to reappropriate, to retrieve. And so part of, what I'm, of my project has indeed been a sort of retrieval of these fundamental notions. And I would argue that this retrieval of place is itself fundamental to a retrieval, for instance, of the ethical, to a ret retrieval also of notions of justice and a whole set of other notions as well. Um, so, uh, thank the you. The next question is over here, and then Elizabeth in the back. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I think it's noteworthy that like many questions that are coming up are like concerned with recent political developments, or that's yeah. how I understand them. I, th I thought I'd say, say that to, for in, the, in the beginning of my question, because mine is also like coming from the same direction, so to speak. There's an interesting commentary that I thought of in Spivak's uh, critique of post-colonial reason regarding, regarding, regarding Heidegger's um, problematization of space and place. And the comment that she is making is that she's saying, isn't there a, um, a, a pre-given understanding of Heidegger being able to map the territory of space and place, so to speak, right? And then for Spivak, of course, the idea would be that the whole idea of uh, of mapping an empty territory is exactly the colonial imperialist idea um, that has brought about global capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the idea, her idea would be, isn't there a more, exactly a more deep entanglement between a, a, a move of thinking, I'm gonna map this territory. If you read, you know, like if you read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason and he speaks of like, the land of pure reason that has no inhabitants and we can just go there. This is very clearly a colonial, um, a colonial fantasy, fantasy right there. And of course the classical move to get out of that problem is exactly what you just did, right? To say, you know, anthropology, people are stupid when they look at other people, but really there's this realm of pure ontology and it might be entangled in, in ways, but like we should, we should keep it more pure somehow. And it strikes me, or I wonder if more pure doesn't just mean um, more white and more connected to like a certain idea of purified rationalism that in fact is placed geopolitically in a certain European heritage that we are participating in, right? Um, which, which is actually my question, right? Like the, the question would be how do we even, how do we even start thinking about these things, given that we are in a place that is protected by strong border control forces, Frontex, right? Like, that we are working in a tradition that, like, was violently purified to be white, mostly, to be Christian, Christian, Judeo, like, Judeo-Christian, mostly, and these kinds of things, right? And this is exactly, I think, the point that Spivak makes, right? Like, in, the, in this initial move of saying, I can say something about these, this conceptual framework. I feel there's a, there's a grand omission of the place of philosophy and the place of philosophy, the geopolitical place of philosophy is not indeterminate. So I feel, you know, like there's another, there's a whole other territory, if you will, uncharted territory in your talk, I would think, um, of, uh, of the geopolitical place of philosophy that would be important to integrate in some way. We could also ask about the geopolitical place of philosophy, but we could also ask from where does Spivak speak? From where do any of us speak? Nobody speaks from nowhere. The only place we have to speak from is the place we already are. This is not a, a, an unusual claim. It's not a difficult claim. It's a really simple claim. I think much of contemporary thinking doesn't pay attention to the simple. And the simple fact is we all speak from somewhere. We cannot speak from nowhere. That way lies not just silence but oblivion. All we can do is speak from where we are and pay attention to that place and pay attention to those with whom we speak. But we get nowhere 
by simply responding to the other, by saying, you cannot speak from there, or you are not speaking from some other place. There is no other place. But that's not what it says. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there was more there, right? Um, if that's all you said, then that's fine, right? Then we're in agreement. I didn't say don't speak. I said, yeah, you are in a specific place, and isn't it important to, to mark that and talk about that and start from exactly there? Well, it's also important to actually to respond to what's said. So it's not a... I mean, one of the concerns I have in a lot of contemporary theory is that rather than respond to specific claims, the discourse is often moved to a different level. So rather than respond, let's say, to specific claims that are being made about the subject matter in question, there's a tendency to move, if you like, to what is often thought of as a political realm of discourse, but which often doesn't address the fundamental claims that are being made. Now, that's really important, because it's, it's about thinking about that place of speaking and what's being said and who's being responded to. Now, we could, of course, I could, of course, gone and we could have talked more about, about let's say, the particular historical or geographical or geopolitical context in which I'm speaking or White speaks or Spivak speaks. We could do that. That may not help us with the subject matter, with the object of the discussion that I was addressing here. It might take us to a different sort of place. Okay? If I'd given this, if I've given these sorts, I give these sorts of talks, I've talked about place in lots of different audiences, whether I get Specifically, a lot of political questions depends on the audience. I'll be talking next week in Melbourne to a different audience. My bet is I won't get many political questions there. So it depends on the audience because it depends on what are the prior interests of the audience. What are the prior interests of the speaker and the people that the speaker is addressing? Um, I don't actually... I mean, you can argue that... In, I, don't, I don't think you talked about this idea of mapping empty space in Heidegger. I don't actually think he's doing that at all. Um, I don't think there's any empty space that he's mapping, and I don't think he's mapping. Um, he is engaged in a certain sort of conceptual activity. And again, one of the things that I think is, is sometimes done is to assume that when one moves to a certain conceptual realm, one is engaged in purification or whatever. I didn't use the language of the pure. I talked about retrieving, going back to... If I go back to a place that I've been... I'm not returning to somewhere pure. I'm not purifying that. I'm simply going back. I'm simply trying to see where, where am I now on the base of where I was? Where could I have been? So, now I would argue that when we engage in that more, even when we engage in that more general critique, that more general critique operates in the same way I'm talking about here. It operates by way of trying to orient and reorient ourselves. It itself is dependent on understanding and, and interrogating its own place. So, you know, we could argue about specific claims I'm making. We could do that. Or we could talk about something else. But we need to be clear, what is it that we're talking about? And how is it relevant here? Otherwise, it becomes too easy to simply object to somebody that, oh, you're white, or you're male, or you're female, or you're black, or you're from whatever. Okay? You have to keep the place character of your speaking and the other person speaking in, to, in mind, but you also have to address the subject matter that's at issue. You have to address what it is that concerns us. Uh, and I actually think that what ought to concern all of us, in, regardless of the particular political critiques we want to make, is where we now find ourselves. And that's an issue for us in Australia. It's an issue for settler Australians as well as Aboriginal Australians. It's an issue for those of us who find ourselves in the Asia-Pacific region, in Europe, in America. In all sorts of different ways is this issue instantiated. But it's an issue about where we are and how we respond to that place. Um, we can use different language to talk about that if you want. Um, but it seems to me that that's the fundamental problem we have. And I don't think that's changed by recasting that in terms of uh, a post-colonialist rhetoric or whatever. And sometimes, sometimes, even in people whose views or way of putting things we don't agree with, we might also find important indications of how to think and how to respond to that place in which we find ourselves. <laughs>
So I know that doesn't address everything that you're saying, but hopefully it's a start. Yeah, thanks for your elaboration. I think the ball is still in your court, but let's continue. Thank you for the talk. I wanted to um, um, follow up on the last two questions. I'm completely with you, Jeff, on the importance of place, openness, the um, address to a particular uh, interlocutor, the importance of uh, speaking language, the importance of singularity. I'm completely with you on that. Can you hear me? Um, you're, this, um, I'm, I can most of the time. I might have to ask you to repeat something, but we're OK at the moment. I'm completely with you on that. But right now, you're char uh, um, characterizing the debate that is happening in terms of an opposition between singularity and a kind of generalizing type of politics. And I think that's a mischaracterization because it's pretty well possible to point about to the kinds of moments of openness and the kinds of moments of relationality and the kinds of moments you know, where identity and difference are under co-production, like the Malopanti type of uh, chiasm moment that you were sketching uh, earlier on about identity, identity and difference, it's quite possible to point to those moments and to recognize both the importance of systematicity and singularity. And some of the replies you have been making have been, to the last two questions, have been in the order of, oh, we shouldn't be generalizing about things like race and gender. But you can pretty well both recognize that there are systemic determinants that bear on these moments of uh, individual address where we um, address a particular other. Um, you, you, can, you can at the same time recognize that there are forces, systemic forces of gender and race and coloniality and class in play at the same moment as that there is a certain openness there to something different and certain indeterminate, uh, certain indeterminateness. Indeterminacy and determinacy quite well go together. So I feel it's a caricature of the very important questions that people are raising about precisely these histories that bear on the one-on-one -on -one address between, in a given place. Again, I'm with you on the importance of place. But it is also very remarkable that in reply to the last question regarding Spivak, who precisely has been raising such questions as, who can speak? Um, can the subaltern speak? You know, these kinds of questions suggest that the one-on-one -on -one encounter is not an open field. The op and insofar as there are opennesses there, there are also closures uh, there. So again, I'm with you on the importance of singularity, but I think you deny in your thinking about what place is, you speak as if one, in a certain sense, can access that fairly unproblematically. But that's a too simplistic epistemology. What is place? What is the other? Even to characterize that, you have to have a more complicated account of the situation of address in which both singularities and determinacies play out. Yeah, no, I'm not sure I, he I heard all of that. But what I would emphasize, okay, is that a very basic point for me is that, of, is that we are all placed, okay? That placement is what enables our speaking. Now, it can also close it off. Right? I'm not denying that. Of course that's possible. But there is no other place for you to speak than, than where you are. So either you engage with those issues of difference, you engage with those issues of, of power as they're operate, operative in particular situations of encounter, but, but there's no way of doing away with them. There's no way... So when I talk about the, about the openness that belongs to place, I'm not suggesting that this is somehow... You know, it's just a panacea. You, you get into place and suddenly it does away with all of this. It's always a task. So, so I'm, I'm not sure I should be... And that may not have captured everything that you said, because as I said, it's, it's actually a little bit difficult to hear from up the back there. But, but I'm certainly not suggesting that you ignore these issues of gender or any of the other issues that are at stake here. But the, my point is a really simple one, and that is that... You can't engage with the world other than by being in the world in a certain way. Being in the world in that way closes you off to things. 
but it also opens you up to things as well. And in, fact, the, uh, and in fact, it's only through being in the world in a certain way that you can be opened up, even to the possibility of your own closedness and of other forms of closure that might operate in a particular situation. Now, this is a really simple point. I think it's a point that's sometimes forgotten, even though I don't think it's intentionally forgotten in a lot of the discourse in which we engage. But it's a really simple point. I don't have any panacea, any answer as to how we deal with problems of oppression, problems of discrimination as they operate in our world, as they operate in the places in which we must speak. But the only reason we have for, what, for needing to engage with those issues is because we are here. We are already committed to speaking. We're already concerned about that which, can, that which is common to us. So I don't think there's a solution. I don't think talking in general terms about the colonial and um, this, that and the other necessarily helps us always. It might help us in some specific situations, but it's, again, it's not a universal panacea. And if there is, more generally what I might say is, that I think one of the great problems is that we have lots of theoretical perspectives that are generated very often by particular political issues and particular concerns about oppression or whatever. And sometimes we generalise from those into forms of politics that actually do more harm than good, that do not engage with the specific issues that are before us. So if you look at the problems with populist politics, you look at the problems with the right wing across, around the world, and what you see are responses to, if you like, what I might think of, you might almost think of as totalising positions that emerge from both the left and the right, positions that are often well-intentioned, well particularly on the left, but which often erect for themselves their own worst opponents. And so in the end, I'll say, as I said to Demetrius, that the only possibility for a politics is to come back to forms of much more concrete engagement, to come back to the places in which we ourselves stand, which are the only places we have. There is nowhere else. There is no non-oppressive utopia from which we can speak. But to come back here, pay attention to those with whom we speak, pay attention to the complexities of that situation. But no, no general theory, whether it's post-colonial or feminist or post-feminist or whatever, will necessarily help us there. And one of our mistakes has been to assume that it will. And the history of the last 10 years, if it tells us anything, it tells us we need a different way forward because it's not working. So. In the interest of staying close to our schedule, perhaps we can adjourn for now. Uh, thank you to Jeff and to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.